I like my little wind chime. It never rings, so I reach over and ring it once in a while. <laughs> just to make sure it really does. Uh, but have you ever noticed that there's always somebody trying to make you perfect? Sometimes you're trying to make you perfect. <laughs> or should I say it a different way? Sometimes you're trying to act perfect. Okay, maybe sometimes you're trying to act perfect and then sometimes you're trying to be perfect. Hmm. <laughs> How's it working out for you? <laughs> of course, there's the other side of the coin, too. There's always somebody who wants you to be perfect. Have you ever noticed that, too? That, first of all, if you've got, you know, maybe your parents, if you're a child, or if you were a child, of course, we've all been a child at some point in time, haven't we? that wanted you to be perfect. Of course, when you were born, they thought you were perfect, and then you showed them, didn't you? <laughs> you proved you weren't perfect. <laughs> and you went out of your way to do it. Well, you know, in faith, God, sometimes that happens too, you know? God looks at you, and you get saved, and He sees you perfect, you know? And then you got to go out of your way to prove you're not, you know? Or maybe you went out of your way to prove you were, and you found out you're not. Either way, this may come as a shock. You're not perfect. <laughs> not in your own estimation. And frankly, not in anybody else's either. Well, I guess we just can't measure up to our own standards that we set for ourselves. And you know what? One of the things I found is that you really can't measure up to anyone else's standards that they set up for you. Seems like every time someone sets up a standard, really the only person who should be following that standard is the person that set up the standard. Because whatever measure they're measuring out that perfection, they don't seem to measure up to. So how are we supposed to know that their standard is right? I don't know. Isn't there a standard somewhere that we could measure up to? That we would hold ourselves accountable to? Well, you know, there is. As a matter of fact, you know, God set a standard and we didn't measure up to it. Now, let's get real for a minute. At some point in time after God set up the standard, there were some really sneaky people. They were so sneaky. How sneaky were they? Well, let me tell you. I'll tell you how sneaky they were. Were they sneaky? Of course they were sneaky. How sneaky do you think they were? They were pretty sneaky. Oh, they're so sneaky. You know how sneaky they were? They thought they measured up. Imagine that. Thinking they measured up to God's standard. They were Jewish. Pertaining to the law, they were perfect. Pertaining to righteousness, holy. Really? Well... Yeah, till Jesus came. <laughs> Oops. There's that name again. Jesus. Well, you know, these sneaky little people, they weren't so holy after all. These sneaky little people, they weren't so righteous after all. These sneaky little people, <laughs> when they found that Jesus, you know, comes along and says, Hey, I saw what you did in darkness. I saw what you were doing when no one's looking. I saw this and I saw that and I know that you reinterpreted everything to measure up to a standard. But you know what? I got a new standard for you. It's tougher than the old standard. Matter of fact, it's what the standard was supposed to be in the first place. Perfect. Well, we are perfect. No, you're not. I don't think so. Let me tell you, let me tell you what perfect is. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No, we don't do that. I don't think so. Love your enemies. Bless those of misery who persecute you unrighteously. And they went, what do you mean? Of course, the ones who had been sneaky went, oops, he got us. <laughs> That's what it was all along. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> You know, we killed the prophets, you know, when they told us what was wrong. We killed, you know, kind of like, you know, anybody else who told us what was wrong, you know. And we even did it right outside the temple, you know, when they told us it was wrong. But, uh, 
maybe we ought to wipe this guy out before he really tells us what's wrong. I think he told us what was right, too. Because, you see, God did set up a standard for us. But the standard was never meant to be measured up to by way of us able to do it. The standard is what God is. That's all. God said, look, I understand. You want to understand me and you want to know me and you want to see me as I am and you want to, oh, be with me. But let me, let me explain to you what I am like. Let me explain to you who I am. You know, let me, let me give you a, just a, a touch of what I, as creator of the universe, am really like. I'm perfect. I'm all consuming fire. Anything that isn't perfect will be poof in my sight. You ain't got no covering? Poof! You're wiped out. Sorry. You need to put some oil over it or else you're going to be consumed like fire because while the oil is on you, I won't consume you. I'll consume the oil. But believe me, if that oil wears out, poof, you're dust. Because you see, that kind of holiness, that kind of perfection, consumes all imperfection. It wipes it out, annihilates it. The dust becomes undone, as John said. So you really don't want to know and be where I am, because where I am, as I am, because I am that I am, it's kind of like, perfect, and you are not. So this is what it's like, and I'm just telling you, this is the standard. You can't meet it. So, Jesus said, if you're in me, then you would be okay. But if you're out of me, you wouldn't be so good. Because you see, in me, it's kind of like being like in some oil, you know, and then you kind of like you're covered. Well, you know, those bulls, you know, that you kept, you know, sacrificing, those animals you kept sacrificing, you know, those things covered you like, kind of like oil, you know, it's kind of like... It worked for a while, but if you stayed too long in, in God's presence, I don't know how to tell you this, but it was only temporary. It wasn't going to last very long. But if I perfectly offer up myself as a substitute for you, if I become sin for you, if I take all your sins upon me, Maybe God could take care of it for us, you know? Maybe because I am God, and my Father is God, and His Spirit is God, we could, like, you know, eliminate this problem in the first place. So maybe if we eliminate the problem, we can come up with the solution. So the standard will always be there, and you'll be able to meet the standard because you'll be inside of the solution. So if the solution covers you and takes care of the problem, then you're perfect. <gasps> Everybody went... Huh? <laughs> so that there was no idea what the world he was talking about. What's he talking about? And that's what they did. They didn't have a clue. When they did think about it, still didn't like it. It's like, no, nah, there's got to be something to this. You know, there's got to be a catch. Can't be just, he takes care of it and we just take it in, you know, and accept it. Because he didn't tell us things we had to do, you know, we had to do this, do that, and the other thing. And we really don't want to do this love thing, you know. It's like, man, I've gotten kind of used to hating the Romans, you know, and I got kind of used to hating all the Gentiles, and I hated all these different people, so why would I want to, you know, like, take this new way, this new understanding of this standard, and meet the standard by God balancing the scales in a perfect balance and finding the right way to do everything. I don't think I want to do it that way. So they didn't. Now, will they someday? Of course they will. But you see, in the meantime, a whole bunch of people came in. That's you and me. Some of them are Jewish. Ooh, hey, hi. Some of them are. Ooh, hey, oh. Really? Non-Jewish? Well, everybody had their own ideas, and everybody had their own ways, and everybody had their own thoughts. So they all kind of like said, well, you know, 
they tried it this way, let's try it that way. And then they tried that way, and that didn't work, so they said, okay, well, let's no longer do that way, but let's do this way. And then when they tried this way, it worked for a while, then didn't it work, then they went the other way, so when they went the other way, then they tried that way. And that's kind of what denominations do. Everybody's trying to do it their way. You know, they don't really know what way they want to do it, because they always got a standard that they want to do in order to protect everybody from doing it the way that they wanted to do in the first place, which was to find God, and they didn't find God, so they went ahead and went another way. So every time they didn't find what they were looking for, they kind of tried to make something new, you know, kind of add to it, you know, and make it something else, and add to that, and add to this. You know what it's like. I mean, come on now, let's be real. When you were still perfect in your father's and mother's eyes, you know, you brought to them your grade card, you know, and there you got straight A's, and they said, oh, good job. Now, next year, could you get straight A's? And you went, but I just measured up. You want me to do it next year, too? Straight A's? Perfect? You want me to do it next year, too? But I just measured up. You mean you... And so they kept changing the time span. You know, you weren't perfect all the time. Then suddenly you got busted for something you didn't do, and you went, well, that's not fair. I didn't do it. And I got in trouble for it. And I was Scott's, and I was my parents' perfect child. I was the only child, and now there's another one. Well, anyways, forget about that part. Let's just stick with you were perfect until they said you weren't perfect, right? Well, it seems like whenever we start mixing and matching standards that people set for themselves or set for others or try to tell others or try to do for others, you never get a set standard that stays the same. So, it's really easier to just leave the standard alone that you can't measure up and figure out how you could come up with a solution. And the bottom line was the solution was Jesus, because he said it was. He said he was the solution to all of man's issues, whether perfection, whether failing, whether righteous, whether unholy, whether holy. So. Whenever people try to tell you to do something in order to get something, think about it for a while then, ask God about it, because maybe his standard might be unattainable, but there might be a solution for it, where other people's standards really are attainable, because you could con them for a while, and you'll measure up to their standard, and they'll like you until you don't measure up to their standard. So, rather than try to please men by their standards, I think we can please God by His measuring a different standard for us, by giving us a solution to be measured or given forgiveness. Oh, you mean because I can't measure up, I could be forgiven for not measuring up? Wow, that sounds easy. You mean if if I can't measure up to perfection, and then the person who's holding me accountable for that perfection says, I forgive you, then the standard is still there, but I'm forgiven for not measuring up to that standard. So, you mean I'm being given salvation? Well, no, because that's salvation means about not going to hell. What you're being given is forgiveness. So, but, but wait a minute, you mean, if I didn't measure up to that standard, I'd go to hell? But that doesn't seem fair. Well, in heaven, if you go to heaven, you're going to be consumed. So, you got to go someplace where, you know, my perfection isn't. Because I kind of created a place for all imperfect things. I'm going to put all these imperfect things in the lake of fire. Well, okay, yeah, eternally, you know, it's going to kind of suck. It's going to be kind of tormenting because I'm giving you a way to be perfect, to be forgiven for not being perfect, and I'm giving you a way to be kept away from that place of imperfection so that you could be with me in perfection. Oh, so you're doing it and I'm not, right? So you mean to tell me that if I'm forgiven, then because of what Jesus did, 
you're accepting his sacrifice or his what he did for me so that instead of me having to measure up to your standard by being perfect you're telling me that he measured up to your standard and has offered his life as the requirement for me to be perfect. So, does that mean now that I have to be perfect? But, I can't be, can I? But, but how does that work? Well, the standard is still there. It's been set. To be perfect, guess what? You got to measure up to it. And since you can't, you got to be forgiven. So how are you forgiven? Because you give me forgiveness, I need a word to... What do I call it when you give me forgiveness that I don't deserve? What do I call it when you tell me that I can be forgiven for not measuring up to the standard that you want for me? Grace. Grace? Yeah, you know, that kind of thing that, you know, the kings used to do and say, grace be upon you, you know, just, I forgive you, it's okay, don't worry about it, I got it covered, I'll take care of it. That's what grace is? So you see, every time that this holiness movement or some other movement tries to tell you to do something about getting yourself cleaned up, getting yourself fixed up, getting yourself worked up, getting yourself filled up, <laughs> just... Spread a little grace around, you know, and just say, grace for grace, mercy for mercy. God has taken care of that standard for me. So as far as he's concerned, I'm perfect. And I, can, I can accept what he's done for me, and I can accept what he's doing in me. Because you see, when God set the standard, he set it because he said, if you will accept what I am going to do, as well as what I have done, then while you are alive, I will work in you to bring about what I want for you in every moment of your life so that even in your imperfection you could be perfect for the moment that I have you living to reach out to other imperfect people to tell them about how your imperfection has become perfection because I have forgiven you for your imperfection. Well, that makes sense when you say it that way. Huh. That sounds easy. Doesn't it? Maybe. Christian perfection. Not as though I already attained, either were already made perfect. Philippians 3.12 It is a snare to imagine that God wants us it is a snare to imagine that God wants to make us perfect specimens of what he can do. God's purpose is to make us one with himself. The emphasis of holiness movements is apt to be that God is producing specimens of holiness to put in his museum. If you go off on this idea of personal holiness, the dead set of your life will not be for God but for what you call the manifestation of God in your life. It can never be God's will that I should be sick. Oh, no, of course not. If it was God's will to bruise his own son, why should he not bruise you? The thing that tells for God is not your relevant consistency to an idea of what a saint should be, but your real vital relationship to Jesus himself, to being one with the Father and one with the Son. Your complete abandonment to Him, whether you are well or ill, determines whether or not you are accepting His will for your life. Christian perfection is not, and never can be, human perfection. Human perfection will always try to see what it can attain to on the outside, while God works from the inside to bring perfection outside. Christian perfection is the perfection of a relationship to God which shows itself amidst the irrelevancies of human life. When you obey the call of Jesus Christ, the first thing that strikes you is the irrelevancy of the things you have to do. 
you don't have to do much of anything, really, except you accept what God has done. And the next thing that strikes you is the fact that other people seem to be living perfectly consistent lives. They seem to move into consistency without having to work at it or to make it a part of some effort on their own. God seems to do it in them and for them. Such lies are apt to leave you with the idea that God is unnecessary. By human effort and devotion, we can reach the standard God wants, which is untrue. In a fallen world, this can never be done. I am called to live in perfect relationship to God so that my life produces a longing after God in other lives, but not admiration for myself. Thoughts about myself hinder my usefulness to God. God is not after perfecting me to be a specimen in his showroom or for people to follow me as I follow him. He is getting me to the place where he can use me to accomplish his purposes for his will according to what he wants to do at the moment he does it. Let him do what he likes, and you'll find that as you are doing what he chose to do in you, with you, and for you, will be the perfect example of how God makes perfection out of and in the midst of imperfection.